children in need of mother and dad for us. I feel, Bob, what do you got? Well, uh, first of all, I wanted to say that if the uh, we have the most wonderful aunts in our family. You know, we just, uh, they're all just fantastic women and just love us like we were their kids, you know, and so that's a, that's a big memory for me. Um, talking about mother just for a second, the uh, an interesting story, mother was born December 5th, 1908, but her, um, the story really begins for us in April the 18th of 1906, and that is when uh, her mother was uh, living in the state of Washington and came down to visit her cousin in San Francisco. She was down there for a few days and in the early morning of April 18th, 1906, the great earthquake hit San Francisco. So uh, because of that, uh, there was so much uh, devastation in the area that uh, mother's mother decided to stay there. And she was like 21 years old, or 22 years old, but she stayed in San Francisco to, uh, there was a lot of jobs available to help with the rebuilding, uh, et cetera. So, so we've got uh, Myra Edna, Edna Tuttle, and now in San Francisco working, uh, ended up working at a, uh, uh, eventually for a uh, home for the blind. And during the same time, the, because of the opportunities in San Francisco, we've got this young man in Illinois, J. Will Schaefer, that came out to San Francisco to uh, help rebuild because of the opportunities to rebuild San Francisco. Uh, so they met at the. They, he went to work as a night watchman at the uh, this home for the blind, and the bottom line is. Uh, they ended up getting together. They got they got married uh, a year and something later in Berkeley, California. Uh, my mother was born. So uh, the five boys in this room really had are here as a result of the San Francisco earthquake. If that hadn't happened, these union would not have come together. You know, but so it's kind of an interesting uh, interesting story about that because of the earthquake. But uh, then. Uh, there's much more, obviously, about mother and growing up. Uh, her her mother died at a very early age. Her mother died like at age 40 from pneumonia, and so mother was left with kind of being the big sister slash mother to her sisters. And I, I remember there's a, a, a picture of mother. You see mother, then, uh, and I don't know which one's next, but the I know Aunt Geraldine and Aunt. Uh, Marion. 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 And, and, you know, there's like a line of these three kids, tall, you know, just going down. And it was just kind of a sad, uh, sad picture. But uh, the uh, then I, I want to jump over for a second. Some of the things that Mother was really had a passion for was about the latest Bible class. And she uh, did a fantastic job and had, the, you know, the Bible class ended up going on for over 50 years. And uh, we had it in our house. And the guys in here know very well about setting the chairs up on Wednesday morning. And it, it, it got to where I think Dad bought about 50 chairs and he had to buy another 25 chairs. But every Wednesday, we'd have to set all those chairs up in the living room. We had the right area to do it in. But uh, it was a very special time with the, with the Bible class that Mother had. But for so, how many years was it, Bob? Well, it, it actually, and, and I think in our house, it was on for like nine years. Okay, I, yeah, yeah. But okay. the, the class yeah. continued, and it was really uh, up off of Edgefield. Yeah, and, yeah, and with Methodist. Yeah, they moved up there, and it was, it the her starting that continued for, yeah, okay. continued for more than 50 years. So. Well, she tells a story about, you know, that she said, Lord, I've got these kids. I said, what can I do to, 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 to help? You know the, you know the cause, and and he just showed her that uh, well you can start a Bible class in your home, and that's all she could do, and that, that that's how it got started. Yeah, I remember as a kid, I used to have to go up. They put us upstairs when about we set the chairs up. Or, no, they, no, they, no, they, no. First, no. Larry and I set chairs. Yeah. Up. Oh yeah, right. Larry and I set chairs. Well, I've got calluses on my hands yeah, in those right. chairs. Yeah, right. But there was actually in the bedroom that was <laughs> Sonny's bedroom, and came down to why well, the, the 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 corner bedroom was where. 
there was kind of a, a nursery uh, area, and I was, uh, the Bible class started in um, the fall of 1949, and I was born in December of 49, and I was the first uh, Bible class uh, baby. I'm still looking for the certificate on that, but anyway, that's what I've been told. But, uh, but then that Mrs. Tiffin uh, was kind of the, the uh, nursery lady that took care of the kids, and you know, I'm sure we've all seen the pictures out in our yard of 75 women out there together, which was quite a quite a uh, accomplishment, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, they carried that on down to the lake too, didn't they? That's that, right. They, they did have uh, they did have uh, some Bible class related or, or uh, Bible study mm -hmm. time down at the lake in the living room. I think that's why Dad built the, the living room at the lake was built specifically for holding a big group of people. It's large. Yeah. So. Your mom was a strong woman. Yeah. Well, put up with some of these guys and she had <laughs> Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> I do. <laughs> you do. <laughs> well, see, I was 50 miles away. Y'all were all together. Yeah. And this I don't know a lot of this. We'd come up once a month maybe or something like that <clears throat> and see you guys and then go back home. <laughs> Country pumpkins. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd love to go visit at the big house. That was a blast. And I was just amazed that you had a water fountain in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> also a boat motor sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> no time I was in that kitchen. But that water fountain, I'd never heard of such a thing. Fantastic. Yeah. That was, we had a, and on the big house, also, you know, in my mind as a kid, I thought, and big was just so big because it was so much larger than any of my friends' houses here. <laughs> but then if you go back and look at the records, wasn't it about 1,600 square foot or something like that? Uh, Remember it, what the size it, of the house was? Yeah, With the upstairs, too? Well, uh, the upstairs I think. it wasn't but, finished. Or part <laughs> of yeah, yeah, part of it wasn't finished. Dad was going to put a bathroom up there, but it just never it never happened. I remember but, trying to climb up those stairs and not fall through something. <laughs> but when you look at the size of the house, all of a sudden, you know, it, it, wasn't, all that big. it wasn't that big. Uh, well, from the outside, it looks big. Yeah, I know, but, but, it, but it thinking looks, of 1,600 square foot, thing, foot think about that. Does it? <coughs> you know, about, it's just not as big as it used to be. It doesn't, no. look, doesn't look that it looks small. You know, the kitchen was uh, pretty interesting to think about. We grew up with a stove that had four burners, a grill, and four roper, burners. Roper stove. And roper three, sound it was like well, a that roper was stove. Uh, you, could, you could cook a lot of beans on that stove. Yeah. <laughs> Dad bought that at the state fair that year and went out to the state fair, which he went every year to the state fair and uh, bought this Roper Town and Country stove. It had right boxes, four burners on each side, a grill and two ovens and a whatever. Brawlers. It was a restaurant size. Yeah, it, had, it had like two, two, a couple, at least a couple of ovens separate yeah. in oh, yeah. wow. and a brawler. Well, I'll tell you, that was something. Yeah. Well, they were very welcoming and loving. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. yes. And you know what? Um, your dad, we'd all come in for Christmas, and all of his cousins would get a dollar for Christmas. And he'd say, you bring it back next Christmas, and I'll give you another dollar. Mm. I brought mine back. <laughs> <laughs> he probably borrowed it. Just <laughs> Blow me a dollar, I'll be back in a couple days. Yeah. <laughs> I think he told me the same way, but I never got the other dollar. <laughs> Well, he gives us a dollar to go to the state fair every year, and he said the same thing. Now, bring back, what do you bring back? I'll match it, which I never did bring anything back, you know. But, but I guess that was his way of trying to get you to realize the value of money and just yeah. hold on to it. But one thing about Dad that we could all say that uh, we, uh, what we had that a lot of people didn't have was security. We knew that every day at 5.30, Dad would come to the back door, wash up, splash, you know, water over over the, the kitchen and we'd all sit at the table have a meal together. Dad would pray, say grace, and we'd all have a meal together. Yeah. And uh, he, he's a very faithful and uh, mm -hmm. we blessed to have a stability in yeah, that family stability. that a lot of families don't have now, you know, so. Well, yeah, most yeah. especially back then, there wasn't that much to earn, yeah. you know, <clears throat> and all you kids. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mother had to, <clears throat> be ready 
at all times to dad say, I'm bringing somebody home, and whether it was people, missionaries from the church or whatever, uh, you know, <laughs> she would, she would uh, just have to pour more water in the bean pot or something, you know, but it, it was, uh, it was kind of neat because we had a lot of large groups of people, <clears throat> big meals and stuff. You know, Dad, Dad used to have the alcohol in the house. He'd have, he'd have friends come over and they'd have cocktails, stuff like that. And mother told him one time, she said, you need to stop that because you got five boys come up. They're going to be doing the same thing that you're doing. So he stopped smoking and stopped drinking. And that's why none of us have ever smoked or drank. <laughs> that's when we all started smoking. <laughs> <laughs> you got to that age quick, huh? <laughs> Well, what about uh, backing that up just a little bit further? What about Dad coming off the farm, you know, and the things that happened and the type, the, the times? Well, I heard Mother say many times that you know, you get a, a five-pound bag of beans for five cents or whatever it was, and the depression and how the depression would have impacted all of our parents. You know, I mean, that would have been a tough deal. For I have some of those um, tickets, yeah, you know, coupons ration, somewhere, ration, 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 ration. and I remember going to the store, and you know, we have to have it sugar and a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. I can't find any of that stuff. I don't know where it went. Well, you know, to, for them to get, they got married December 5th of 1929, and obviously that was a pretty tough time mm -hmm. where uh, I think women could get a job, but men couldn't get a job, and uh, but they managed to, to make it through. And Mother working at Woolworths, yep. wasn't it? Yeah. Why should men get a job? Well, Dad got well, a job at Higginbotham. It, it was harder and to pay during part of that time that, that men couldn't get a job. I'm, I'm not sure. I think why. it was the money. I think they could pay the women less, and that's just the way it was. I'm, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, Mother was making four, she was making fourteen dollars a week at that time uh, when Gloria was a baby. You know, ride the streetcar and transfer and ride another, and then walk for the babysitter and reverse the whole thing in the evening when she got off work. And when things got really tough, they cut her salary in half to seven dollars a week. Oh, wow. And she was happy to get that. You know. Happy to get it. Well and she was so thought of so highly there that other people they, they let other people go but they kept mother on because right. mother was such a, a good worker. good worker. You know. Part of the time dad was working for Higginbotham <clears throat> Pearl Snow or something like that. Six days a week, twelve hour uh, ten or twelve hour days at five bucks a week. What they, kind of place was that? It's it a hardware. It was a hardware. Hard 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 you know, and and they said, if you don't like it, there's the door. You got a line of oh, people yeah. out there waiting to get the yeah. job. Yeah. And it was hard work. Mm -hmm. you know? I want to say it was twelve hour days. I want to mm -hmm. say. Time for tough though. Anything else? Anybody else? I have just a couple of stories. Okay. Y'all talking about the Roper Range and everything. I'm not sure how old I was, maybe five, because Mother told me that she laughed all the way home, but gr Grandma was baking something, I don't know, a pie or whatever, and she had her apron on, and she went over to pull that oven door down, and they had the little holes at the bottom for the heat to come out, and there was a mouse in there. <laughs> <laughs> and she started <clears throat> screaming, and I remember she took that apron and she started tugging on his tail and pulled his tail off. And I don't know how the mouse got out, but that mouse got out. But I guess I told that story to Mother and Mother <laughs> laughed all the way home at me laughing at Grandma. You know? So I do she remember She pulled that. his tail off. And she, got yeah, she grabbed his tail and pulled his tail off. Tell and his little legs were kind of, you know. At the big house <laughs> that we had, I, I guarantee you, we had lots and lots of that mice. Yeah. And they're in the pantry, yeah. you know, you find their trail, their poop trail, all well, inside. You can hear them scurrying yeah. across the <laughs> you know, Mother paid Larry and I one time uh, to catch the mice. She was going to pay us two cents a piece for each one we could catch. So we just got a bunch of traps out, and we live here at night, and click, man, there's one. Go pay two cents. You know? We're just saying, there's some more money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's that's cockroaches. Yeah, you know, cockroaches. If you, if you turn, when you go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, you can hit nine there every time. Oh, mercy. So, and the only other story on? I had was, um, and, and I think you were there. Nick and I would spend a lot of weekends uh, with Grandma and Grandpa. And um, on a Saturday night, Grandpa would read a Bible story to us. Do you remember that? Were you there too? Or were you already? Uh, yeah. He some. may have been. Yeah. Anyway, it's me and Nick, and I know Bob, 
anyway, he would read the story and I'd listen really hard because he always asked questions afterwards, but you always answered them and I... There's going to be a test. <laughs> There's going to be a test. <laughs> but I never... Anyway, I just remember that. He always had a Bible story to read. Well, just an aside, you know, when, when Patty and I first got married, we moved into the little house. I just getting back to cockroaches here for a minute. And what I remember is that when, when when she would get in that bed, she's not going to get up for the rest of the night because of you in there. You know, we're talking, you know, cockroaches. They, they probably weren't that wide, but she was so afraid of all those cockroaches. And if me, it was just, yeah, I see them all the time. It didn't bother me, but it sure bothered her a lot. She wouldn't get up in the middle of the night there. Turn the light on. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. You know, one, one other, quickly, uh, Terry kind of got me think about this was about the uh, Bible stuff was when Dad was real involved in church and was a Sunday school superintendent at Winneka Bible Church and I remember as a little guy going up there Dad always unlocked the he was the one that opened the church up and uh, would print the bulletins and stuff I remember they had a hand crank mimograph machine but um, he was uh, I have some bulletins at home that have some like four or five song titles written on it, you know, like number 16, number 25, That because he did the before um, Sunday school, sometimes he would lead that. And it's kind of kind of nice to have some of the old uh, stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, he, he also came out with a deal that that he was trying to increase attendance. And the, we had these little buttons that we got, I guess in 1958, it says 209 by 59. So uh, they were both very involved in that, which was... Uh, and the prize was, coming from Port of Burgess, Sunny, that little portable radio back then, was a pocket radio, it was an AM pocket radio, was a great big thing, both of you, it had to have a large pocket to put it in. But then Dad had Bob and I invite everybody we know, we had a camp out in the front yard, yeah, yeah. That's what I said. That's what and I said. a whole yeah. bunch of them, took them all to church, and then we run one to the radio. <laughs> I remember we, that night, we, we had all these boys out there in the side yard, I remember, said, okay, who can run across the street in their underwear? And they run away, run back. <laughs> I remember one of those, it rained, because then y'all had to come inside, it rained. I don't know, probably. And, all, and all these guys were on the floor, in the front row. Yeah. Earlier, in the conference, we talked about Mother. Much of the following will be about our father. My brothers and I are grateful for our incredible parents. As we look back, the memories fill our hearts with awe. For us, much of who we are, and much of the men we became, was the direct result of Dad's influence. Dad was the head of the family and ultimately, he called the shots. But make no mistake, their relationship was a solid 50-50 partnership. They operated as a team, mother ran the house, dad brought home the resources. Irvin Wesley Cawthon was born April 22, 1908. He died on August 31, 1973, from cirrhosis of the liver. We believe it was the result of a job-related chemical exposure. He was 65. Dad was the firstborn son of a sharecropper. As a strong and obedient son, he labored in the fields, alongside his father. As the family grew, so did his responsibilities. Along with the crops and the garden, he had seven siblings, that depended on him. He was a supportive and protective brother. Much was expected from this eldest son. It was from that harsh environment, that the foundation was laid, for this farm boy to become a man of great moral character. In Dad's era, farm boys had to grow up fast. By first grade, he had three younger siblings. His one-room schoolhouse offered grades one through six. From letters we know he rode their old mule, Kate, to school, then turned her loose to graze. It is believed that he graduated the sixth grade. Other documents show graded school papers from the ninth grade. We assume that to be the end of his formal education. As a boy, he frequented the nearby revival tent meetings. There he found Christ and became active in the church. His faith lifted him and gave him strength. His love for God and the church became deeply implanted in his core and remained so for his lifetime. 
shortly after his 18th birthday the family suffered another failed harvest. With it came a desperate need for hard cash, cash that only a job could provide. Dad saw the solution, then made what must to have been, a scary decision for a young country boy. He packed a bag and made his way to the big city, Dallas. As a farm boy he was accustomed to working 12-hour days, and six, or even seven-day weeks. Dad was a smart guy mechanically. He could study a problem and come up with a solution. He had an optimistic disposition, along with a get-the-job-done attitude. IT was with those credentials that he quickly found work. From 1926 to 1929, through hard work he prospered. He returned home often to help with the crops. Doing so brought the realization that farm life was not for him. He was a city boy now. In the fall of 1928 he met our mother, Edith Drusilla Schaefer. They shared common family issues, dad with his need to provide support for his parents and siblings, and mother, as she struggled to be a surrogate mother for her three younger sisters. Her mother had passed away the previous winter. It was their shared, deep love of God and their common values that brought them together. They were married on Mother's 21st birthday, December 5, 1929. The years that followed brought the Great Depression, and with it, bread lines, soup kitchens, and food rations. Two years later, January 1932, Gloria Dolores was born. Five years later Irvin Wesley Jr. was born. In 1939 Dad was able to make a deal with the bank to purchase a large, foreclosed home that needed extensive repair. The big house, as we called it, was the home that we all grew up in. In late 1939, all but two of his siblings had departed the farm, leaving his struggling parents and two youngest brothers. Dad helped his parents get them settled in Dallas. Later, he purchased a duplex across the street from the big house. It was there that grandmother and granddad would spend their remaining years. World War II began in September 1939. Early the next year the twins, Larry and Beverly were born, bringing the total to four children, all under the age of eight. The buildup of war materials brought jobs and with it an end to the Great Depression. In December 1941 the U.S. declared war on Germany. Dad's work as a machinist would have exempted him from the draft. Another son, Ronald, was born in August 1942. Dad, now 34 years old, had become a successful entrepreneur. He did so believing, what he so often preached to us, there's no free ride in life, if you have wants or needs, all you have to do is work. Those values were embedded in his kids and ultimately produced seven entrepreneurs. The war was over in September of 1945. By that time, Dad was a partner in Simplex Motor Parts Company. Later he acquired full control. That business would later transition into Cawthon Auto Parts from which he retired. With their discharge from the army, his two younger brothers needed work. A short time later a nearby Sinclair gasoline service station became available. Dad bought it and handed the keys to brothers Jasper and Durward. Through hard work the boys built a successful business and eventually paid him back in full. They retired there 38 years later. I was born in 1947, brother Bob followed in 1949. That completed the family. Two girls and five boys. Growing up in the big house was a secure and happy experience. We had structure, discipline, and love. We were sheltered from the ups and downs. It was not in Dad's nature to complain or even give the slightest hint of a problem. He quietly carried the family burdens and would give you no cause to worry. Mother and Dad put their faith in God, right out front, for all to see. Many times, I watched as Dad invited a new acquaintance to church. They were major contributors in both the leadership and support of Winnetka Bible Church. When the door was open, we were there. First it was Sunday school, then at 11 o'clock worship. 
Dad would then go back for evening worship. Dad often went alone for Wednesday prayer meeting. As kids we had fun participating in Christmas and Easter plays and events. Summers we had vacation Bible school. When missionaries were in town, they were always invited to our house for dinner. While Dad was not a polished musician or preacher, he filled in when needed. On occasion he played the piano for the Monday evening song service at the Dallas Union Gospel Mission. Dad was a big admirer of the Reverend Billy Graham. When the Crusades were televised, we would gather around our tiny black and white TV and watch. His signature song, How Great Thou Art, was one of Dad's favorites. Life in the big house was stable. We had set rules, and we knew what the day would bring. For example, when Dad left for work, he always kissed Mother goodbye. Every evening at 5.30 we knew he would return. After he washed up, we all sat down for a family dinner. Participation was mandatory. At the dinner table the food stayed in the middle until Dad said the prayer. After that, the rule was, take all you want, eat all you take. At all times we were expected to be polite and respectful to everyone. Adults must be addressed as Mr., Mrs., Sir, or Ma'am. When talking to an adult the usage of certain other words were required, yes sir, yes ma'am, no sir, no ma'am, please, and thank you. Mother and dad never once raised their voice to each other or to us. Loud or aggressive behavior from us was not tolerated. Mother was home every day. As kids we spent the day outside exploring our expanded neighborhood. Part of her day was devoted to worrying about her mischievous boys. By the time Bob and I arrived, Mother was at the top of her game, and it was hard to get away with much, but that didn't stop us from trying. Often Mother would get a break from the kids on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon. It would be Dad's time with us. We played games or did fun things like swimming, fishing, horseback riding. The zoo was a big favorite. Along with all the animals we liked the carnival and pony rides. Dad was always there, camera in hand. He loved photography and had the latest equipment. Through the years he took hundreds of pictures. In the early days, film was black and white and had to be developed by hand. Dad built a small room in an attic space and made a darkroom. There he developed the film by dipping it in a series of pans containing various chemicals. Every evening, the day came to an end, at 9 p.m. Before mother and dad went upstairs, we would all gather around, and dad would pray. When one of us had a problem or project to solve, dad encouraged us to think. He would say, use your head, figure things out. If you asked for guidance, he would provide just enough information to get you started. After that, he stood by and watched as you stumbled through the project. If, in that process, you broke something or screwed something up, you wouldn't catch any heat from him. He would simply ask, what did you learn? His method of teaching forced us to think and has served us well as adults. As retirement approached, Dad bought a small tract of land on what was to become Cedar Creek Lake. He divided the land into home sites, some with lake frontage. He put in streets and a water system then began building his retirement home on the point lot with a spectacular view. Not surprising, Dad designed it with a huge main room. Prayer services and Bible study began there, even before the house was finished. Those retirement plans ended very suddenly. With his death, the loss was crushing for all of us. Baby brother Bob was just 23 years old. Dad's life was an incredible blessing to us. The five of us, now in our 70s and 80s, are filled with pride as we look back at the giant impact he made on us. Dad practiced what he preached. He reached out to those in need. He exuded kindness, patience, enthusiasm, compassion, and integrity in everything he did. He was pure in heart and soul, 
and his love of God was his driving force. What we hadn't realized was the impact he had on others. At Dad's funeral we watched as the sanctuary overflowed. Many had made the long drive to the country funeral to pay their respects to our father. That giant outpour of love and respect brought home the realization of the incredible impact his life made on others. He gave of himself, and in doing so impacted and enriched the lives of others, many others. He left this place better than he found it. After Dad's death in 1973, we were blessed to have our dear mother for another 30 years. She was an equally remarkable and powerful force in our life. During those 30 years, Dad surely held her hand from above, as she continued to point down the path, to show us the way. Our dear mother passed away March 16, 2003, at 94. Additionally, we sadly miss our sisters. Beverly died in 2000 at age 60. Gloria died in 2014 at age 82. The five of us remain. As we look back at the choices our parents made, our hearts overflow with gratitude, and for that blessing, we thank God.